The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Welcome to the webinar on cover crops and soil health, brought to you by the Illinois Soybean Checkoff. My name is Kendall Riskadal, and I will be moderating the webinar today. A couple of housekeeping items. If you included your CCA number when you registered for this webinar and you stay with us for the entire presentation, your number will be automatically submitted for one CEU in soil and water management. If you are listening to a recording of this webinar, you will need to go to the Certified Crop Advisor website, log into your account, and apply for self-study credit. There will be an opportunity to ask questions during the webinar by submitting your question using the chat feature. There will be a time for question and answer at the end of the presentation. Please keep questions brief and only on one point. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce Scott Woltman. Scott is a certified crop advisor and the current agronomist and cover crop lead for La Crosse Seed. He is also serves as chair for the Cover Crop Working Group of the American Seed Trade Association. With that, we are ready to start the presentation. Take it away, Scott. Well, good morning, everyone, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, be with you today. Hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. I want to thank the uh, Illinois Soybean Association for allowing me to present today. I really hope to provide a perspective on cover crops that, uh, that you, the listener, finds informative. And hopefully it's one that uh, perhaps you haven't completely heard before. I know there's a lot of messages out there um, on cover crops and what they can do for soil health and for all the different benefits that we're using cover crops today. Um, again, I, I really appreciate your time here this morning. As was mentioned, my name is Scott Woltman and I'm the cover crop lead for lacrosse seed. Um, I tend to look at things through a somewhat pragmatic lens. Um, as part of my job within lacrosse, which is basically engaging our ag retail dealer network <clears throat> from an agronomic perspective, I try to be as practical as humanly possible. If I don't understand it and it doesn't make any logical sense to me, then I sure don't expect our staff or our customers to understand it either. Um, and I'll just say this, this presentation will not be filled with a bunch of uh, scientific jargon, um, basically because I don't speak that language very well. What I hope to accomplish is to, to share my interpretation of the importance of what cover crop means or cover crops mean to today's grower. Okay, I'm trying to forward and I can't forward the next slide here. There we go, sorry about that. Everything works good until the thing starts going and then, uh, and then something, something like that happens every time. So a quick overview on lacrosse seed for those that aren't familiar. So I'm in, employed by a small seed distributor who's based in the upper Midwest, which is lacrosse, Wisconsin to be exact. We've been in business for about 70 years and we endeavor to bring our customers not only, not only the seed they need, but intel and experience from the field as well. You may recognize some of our brands, um, probably the one in the middle, the Tillage Radish. Um, that was initially, uh, you know, developed uh, several years ago, but now for the last few years, that has been our brand. Um, the Guardian is a, uh, is a brand of rye that we sell that is gaining popularity across the country as well. We basically sell everything but corn and soybeans, cover crops, forages, turf, native grass, um, and our customers are predominantly ag retail and the seed supplier channel. Those customers really keep us on our toes and demand that we get the information right. If they don't, or if we don't get it right, we're gonna hear about it. We try to collaborate with the right folks in the industry, making sure our message is sound and always up to date, and we're always learning. Um, myself with my role, I'm given the opportunity to be around a lot of smart people, smarter than I, um, so again, so perhaps some of what I talk about today, maybe you've heard before, um, as was earlier mentioned as well, I am the current chair for the cover crop working group for ASTA, 
which provides me the chance to kind of represent the industry on affairs such as current policy, um, uh, farm bill, um, that kind of thing, as well as like seed quality laws, um, just to name a couple examples. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to visit with folks in Washington, um, probably not necessarily where I want to be all the time, but it gives me a new perspective for sure. And this will be my last slide on lacrosse seed. I think it's important to show what our current territory is, which is basically everything east of the Rocky Mountains uh, in the US. Um, we have a good experience group of reps who work with thousands of retail facilities in that area. And I'll just kind of zoom in here and you can kind of see where I reside. I'm from that uh, Effingham County, Jasper County part of the world here in South Central Illinois. Our family farms about 1500 acres where we employ cover crops on over, I'd say somewhere between 50 and 60% of those acres. So I also think it makes sense to speak to our message um, <clears throat> that we have as a small seed distributor where we market cover crops predominantly. We found the overwhelming reasoning behind growers incorporating covers on new acres or even getting first acclimated to using cover crops at all is time or lack of time. I know the current uh, the current uh, kind of momentum in, in our industry is talk about uh, net farm income and commodity prices and, and the markets on where they're at. But over the last five, six, seven years, cover crop acres continue to increase. And I'm not gonna necessarily talk about that in this presentation, not only as, as a company, our acres and our numbers go up, but the whole market continues to go up as well. Um, and again, we think that has everything to do with guys planning ahead. We think it's critical for growers to plan. Uh, think about all the different considerations that you need to get rounded up or thought through. We're talking about seed procurement, equipment, labor, and then also think about the changes or tweaks you might have to make to your current operation to ensure success, like crop rotations that allow for seeding in time, herbicide programs that don't conflict with a potential cover crop that you might be wanting to plant, and a harvest schedule that permits the earliest possible seeding of those cover crops. Again, it's about time, time to plan and time to physically get the covers in the ground. If we don't get the cover crops planted, then all of what I talked to about today will be mute. And again, you've probably seen this slide before as well, but this kind of speaks to that, to that point. It shows the average first date to 28 degrees uh, freeze. I like the 28 degree mark. I think it's a good barometer as it marks the temperature that first kind of puts a lot of our cover crops um, in a state where they're done growing. Not necessarily stop, but they're not going to necessarily not um, continue and progress a lot further, especially the ones that aren't winter hardy. Of course, winter hardiness is going to depend on where you farm and the hardiness zone of the species you're wanting to plant. But for most of us in Illinois, you're looking at a first hard freeze around the middle of October, maybe through the first week of November. In my view, that's about right. But it, but it also means that in order to get at least a sizable percentage of the growing degree days we need, many of our cover crops like radish, maybe turnips, a lot of our popular legumes, they need to be seeded about maybe seven, eight weeks, maybe even 10 weeks prior to that date that we see there on this map. So, again, doing the math, unless we plan on seeding a winter grain like rye or triticale, the plan should call for a seeding date around somewhere around late August through the first part of September. We can't enjoy the full benefit from these covers if we don't get them, get them seeded timely and effectively. Again, not all cover crops are going to fit into this window. Uh, we talked about rye and small grains. Some of those can be seeded a lot, a lot later in the fall. But if we want to get the true benefit out of these other cover crops, we need to get them planted early. And that, that means probably adjusting your cropping system or cycle a little bit. Okay, I want to try to transition over to soil health. <clears throat> what does that term even mean? Well, this term has been around for a while in the industry. 
Um, and I'll read it. It's the continued capacity of soil as a vital living system whereby plant and animal growth and environmental quality are sustained or regenerated. And it's a holistic approach in which plant, animal, and human health are promoted. So what in the world does all of that mean? I think that sounds pretty good. But what is really important and what does it even matter? I think we all would agree that our soils are our greatest resource. They give us, and when I say us, I mean our entire society life. Soil sustains life and provides nutrients that plants need for food and energy. Soil acts as a buffer against pollutants and they're critical for absorbing and purifying most of the water on earth. And if you think about it, it regulates excess rainfall as well. As a farmer, your long-term productivity depends on maintaining a good healthy soil function if not improving it as we go. I think everybody understands that. <clears throat> so, as we talk about soil health, part of my job today is to talk about how, how cover crops uh, kind of play a role and can they impact soil quality or soil health. I've heard a lot of different ideas and I've, and I've seen a lot of things been talked about on, on what are the kind of some of the, the main ideas behind how cover crops can impact soil health. But there's a couple that stand out a little bit more to me. I would consider these in my mind, I call these a, a principle. The first principle I consider is maximizing biodiversity. We know, I think many of you know that are using cover crops, how important diversity is in our soil ecosystem, not only with using diverse cover crops, or a cover crop mix. And again, we've seen that there's a lot of symbiotic relationships out there with the different cover crop species. Uh, today, across the country, the trend has, gone, has been to go to more small grains like rye, oats, barley, triticale, um, and that's fine. Uh, obviously, we're doing that because we can plant them later in the, uh, in the planting window. But the more cover crops we put out there to an extent, we've seen a symbiotic relationship happen for sure. But it's not only cover crop mixes. It's thinking about how we might be able to, to enhance our cropping system with either maybe a small grain or even integrating livestock or maybe your neighbor's livestock, if you don't have any, into the crop cycle. It's worth noting that the addition of small grains also affords many a greater opportunity to plant cover crops in late summer. It allows an opportunity for us to get planted a little bit earlier. Now I realize that across most of the state of Illinois, we're double cropping soybeans after wheat, but in those areas where maybe uh, there's been livestock on the farm or uh, maybe there's already a complex uh, planting cycle, wheat definitely or a small grain definitely affords us a greater opportunity. And if we think about going back to livestock, if we think about the role herbiv herbivores played across the prairie all those years ago, soils were first developed in this kind of system while all the soil microorganisms were left to, to prosper. And think about organic matter levels, they were much higher than what we have today as well. And I put that little uh, circular motion on there because biodiversity, it's all connected and it's all about the rotation. We need to enhance that rotation. Another way, another principle that I think is extremely important is obviously keeping that soil covered with a continuous living root or roots. With many of our row crops, we're left with a half of a year brown gap where our soils can be left exposed. And I like to illustrate that with this picture here. If you think about harvest all the way through crop emergence in the spring, and you could even argue that an emerging crop still leaves the soil at risk, we're looking at about somewhere between six and seven months. Without a cover crop, not only do we risk losing nitrogen and topsoil, but also ever important organic matter that lies near the surface, as well as the non-soluble phosphorus fraction that's bound to our soil particles. In many parts of the Midwest, including Illinois, and I think most of you guys understand this and realize this already, initiatives are in place to cur curtail phosphorus losses. Just as critical as nitrogen, phosphorus is part of many uh, nutrient loss reduction strategies across the Midwest, all 10 states along the Mississippi River, as well as Indiana and Ohio have been in, uh, instructed by EPA to develop these strategies with the goal of reducing nitrogen and phosphorus losses over the next decade. Again, I think most of you are aware 
of that. I think this this illustration kind of captures what what I'm trying to uh, to talk about um, here is we just need to keep that that ground covered as as much or as long as possible. Another benefit of having continuous living roots is it gives the soil food web, probably heard about the food web, something to feed on. Without roots, soil organisms and beneficial insects are short on food. Pretty easy to understand, I think. Organic matter is fed on by fungi and nematodes, which are fed on by, you can see there, arthropods and other animals. It's all connected and it all starts with plant residues. And I don't wanna forget, Growing plants guard soil from wind and water erosion as well. I think it's interesting how some folks don't necessarily contribute or tie erosion prevention to soil health improvements. To me, it makes a lot of sense because our most productive soils rest near the surface of, our, of what we farm. Not only do more biological processes happen near the soil surface, but there's greater nutrient availability as well as more organic matter that we just talked about. And why is this so important? Obviously, again, consider all of the water quality efforts and initiatives that are going on across the country. Um, we need to keep our greatest resource where it belongs. This here picture is a field uh, just down the road from where we farm, and it's even a no-till field. And it shows that even no-till fields are prone to, to water erosion. And just consider how water erosion occurs. Water droplets hit the ground, drastically hit the ground and con contact the soil surface. And that leads to detachment of the soil uh, molecule, which leads to transport and then to soil deposition. The presence of a cover crop here would have intercepted those water droplets for sure. Take into account the presence of root and earthworm channels alongside cover crop roots that are holding the soil in place. And it's not too hard to argue how one could eliminate about 90% of soil losses from erosion. And I use the 90% because multiple research projects across the country point to about a 90% difference in soil loss where covers are in place. And let's not forget about wind erosion either. Um, if you remember um, the windstorms that happened across the state of Illinois a year ago, I, be I believe in May, um, uh, they had a great impact. In fact, I think there might have been a fatality or two caused from those dust storms. I think an interesting thing to, to, to see from this National Weather Service bulletin here is the last bullet point, the last sentence there says, note the yellow colors denoting lack of vegetation in the image below to the right. So even though this is May, granted, and there's a lot of, a lot of uh, planning that had already occurred, most of our planning had already occurred, um, it is interesting how much of the ground was left bare. Now, a windstorm in May, you might think that has no correlation with a cover crop because the cover crop would have been gone. But if we're talking about planting green and we're talking about using maybe a small grain in front of a, a soybean, uh, potentially there would be residue there that could keep some of that soil in place. I think, you know, wind erosion is something that I feel I feel like a lot of our, our retailers across the state of Illinois don't necessarily think about a lot. But as we learned last year, it, it is a it is a potential issue. I think I don't want to jump on a soapbox here, but saying on the topic of soil loss, um, you've all heard of Russell or the revised universal soil loss equation. That's been in place for, for quite some time. And I, I, for one, struggle with this a little bit as I'm not convinced it really reflects the current weather shifts that we have today. I understand that there's a new Russell 2, I believe, um, that includes some new science and upgraded modeling. I think it includes a little bit more uh, functionality on, on integrating uh, real erosion into the uh, equation. So that's good. And maybe that'll be an updated model. Um, most states, like Illinois, um, set al allowable soil losses, or the T rate, somewhere around, you know, somewhere between one to five. Most of the soil um, in Illinois has an allowable soil loss of somewhere between three and five tons per acre. I think that's figured based on the fact that three or five tons can be replaced. Again, I struggle with that. 
I guess I don't quite understand this because there's no way we can replace that much soil in a year. If you look at data, uh, recent data from the Midwest, it shows we may be only to uh, be able to replace about a half a ton per year. So what this means is it's gonna take a long, long time to build back any kind of, of topsoil, whether it's a, an inch or even a half, of, half inch of topsoil. It takes a long, long time. By the way, I'll circle three to five tons per acre because again, most of the state were somewhere in that neighborhood for allowable soil loss, depending on our soil type. Curious whether anyone realizes what five tons of soil laid out across an acre actually looks like. How thick is that? Maybe you've heard this uh, metaphor before or this analogy, but it equals the width of a dime. So if you took five tons of soil and laid that out across an acre, that's a dime. In my view, that's pretty easy to go unnoticed, but it can doesn't take long to really add up. Again, five tons equals a dime. On this slide, um, off to the right here, this is something I took from uh, USD or the Illinois uh, Department of Ag. Um, this came out here, here recently. Um, it just shows, and I don't really want to focus on the the state soil conservation funds, but more so the one on the bottom, the graph on the bottom. It shows that um, again, the brown is one to two times the, the tolerable loss rate for a soil type, and the severe erosion in the red is more than two times the T rate. You can see that across most of uh, of this state, or a large portion of this state, there's uh, we're losing at least a little bit more than what necessarily could be replaced. And again, I struggle with how that, that formula is, is uh, formulated today, but that's where we are. And I think if we look at, again, more data from USDA, going back to some of their transect survey data, um, if we look at tillage practices uh, in corn and soybeans from what we had in 2017, I don't necessarily see a huge trend nothing has really changed in the last five or six years. It seems like the numbers, obviously no-till plays a part in here somewhere and we're not counting, no, or we're not counting I'm sorry, cover crop acres here, um, but even no-till, uh, no-till in corn maybe has went up a little bit. Uh, no-till in soybeans I think has remained pretty stagnant and conventional tillage across both corn and soy has stayed fairly flat. In fact, you could argue that it's maybe even increased a little bit. So we have a lot of work to do. I don't think uh, that's the purpose of my talk today to talk about that, but all of what we're doing does affect and our practices do affect how much soil we are losing. So again, it's important that we keep our soil covered with continuous living roots. That's not, that doesn't make sense um, to, to the listeners. I, uh, I think that's, that's a, the most easy thing that cover crops can do. The third way we can impact soils is by minimizing disturbance. Again, less unnecessary tillage, which I just kind of talked about. The more we till, we obviously increase our chances of soil loss from erosion. Tillage causes soil collapse, which reduces pockets in the soil for oxygen and water. And I think we all understand how that can reduce soil aggregation. Think of a difference between, and I like to, to talk about it this way, think of the, di of the difference between a brick and a sponge. That's the gap between a uh, low or very poor pore space in a brick compared to very high pore space in a sponge. Consider how much water holding a brick has compared to a sponge as well. Lastly, tillage destroys our efforts to build organic matter by destroying all of the microorganisms needed to maintain the soil ecosystem. Again, not too hard to figure out, but this happens all the time. The effect of tillage. This has a pro pronounced effect on earthworm populations and activity as well. So earthworms maybe were something that I didn't give a lot of credence to a few years ago. I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about earthworm activity, but I should have. Earthworms serve a, a huge purpose, whether we're talking about uh, night crawlers or all the or, or pale gray worms, red worms. There's, there's a lot of different species of worms out there. These are all creating channels for roots and oxygen and nutrients to follow while feeding on microorganisms and distributing beneficial uh, nutrients along the way. 
Earthworms definitely serve their role in the food web, which is what we talked about earlier. Several studies out of Iowa, I think with the help of University of Illinois, have shown that the middens, you guys have heard of an earthworm midden or a deposit left from night crawlers were 38% higher in cover crop strips versus no-till alone. And since the midden count is a directly re related or consistent with earthworm counts, it shows me anyway that the presence of cover crops positively affects the contributions earthworms can provide. Makes a lot of sense to me. And if we look at tillage, one more slide here. Um, you know, we have slowly taken away soil carbon and organic matter levels for the last 100 years, ever since we started cultivating the ground. Nearly, we've nearly cut our organic matter in half. This is a slide from, from Dr. Weil um, from last year, some of the work he's doing. Um, he's been in this industry for a long time. I would state though that it's not too late with the addition of cover crops and all the other sustainability practices we're talking about today, advances can be made going into the future. But I wanna make no mistake about it, when we till the ground, there goes our carbon sink. We lose carbon for sure. And I think we all understand that. A quick dive into the physical components of soil. Approximately 95% plus is made up of water, gases or, or air and minerals. Minerals is the percentage of sand and silt and clay that our soil is made up of, um, otherwise known as our soil texture. Because different components within our mineral fraction have different negative and neutral charges, this influences a soil's ability to retain nutrients or cations. So you, maybe you've heard of your CEC or your cation exchange capacity. That's what that equates to. But CEC levels typically aren't changed that much. It's hard to change your CEC level. Um, even though soils with higher organic matters tend to have higher CECs. But outside of the us usual assumptions regarding air and water content of a soil, the organic portion of the soil is the main fraction that we have some level of control over. It's that one to 5%. So I talked about principles earlier, which again, those three principles to me are, are ways that cover crops um, can really make a, a huge impact. I wanna now turn to concepts that in my opinion, define what improving soils are all about. And with each of these concepts, cover crops can play a very big role. And I have five, you could argue the last, the last two are kind of similar, but, but they're a little bit different. One would be stabilizing, if not improving soil organic matter. Again, it takes, a, it takes a long time to improve organic matter levels. And if we're not stabilizing, then we're mining organic matter and that's not a very good day either. So I, I like to first think about stabilizing organic matter and then working towards improving that in the future. Two would be improving aggregate stability three, improving nutrient cycling, and four and five are increasing water infiltration and water holding capacity. I'll kind of dive into these a little bit more. When we talk about soil organic matter, it's all about keeping and adding carbon to your system. Plants convert carbon dioxide into glucose, and that glucose includes carbon. Carbon is needed by all organisms in the soil. Everything benefits from carbon. Part of it is used, but most of carbon is exchanged among microorganisms in the soil. And when we have additional carbon, that allows for organic matter to build. I know that's a very simple explanation, but to me, that's what makes sense. Um, row crops typically produce most of the carbon they need, but if we think about what happens at harvest, we tend to export a large percentage of that carbon. And if we think about soybeans and legumes, Leftover carbon feeds the bacteria needed for in production well as well. Legumes benefit from that leftover carbon that feeds the bacteria needed for producing nitrogen. What we can't afford to do is lose carbon to the atmosphere. What we need to do is we need to keep it in our ecosystem. Again, that starts with adding carbon. Carbon converts to organic matter. And just a step further, 
I wanted to add this graphic. Um, our team uses this quite a bit as we're talking about organic matter to ag retail, and we're equating that to fertility costs. 1% organic matter has quite a bit of value, as you would expect. These numbers come from Ohio State, and they come, they, they're from 2014, so they probably need to be updated just a little bit. But nonetheless, they speak to the nutrient value of organic matter, which is much more than just carbon alone. You can also see on the bottom there, the water holding contribution made by increasing organic matter and carbon levels. But I would argue that those cost savings or benefits listed here still don't compare to the long-term advantage one would have if their organic matters increased from say, let's say you were at 1% organic matter and you increased to 2%. That's gonna take a while to do that, but the, uh, the advantage would be way more than just $680 that's represented on this slide. That's a huge, huge shift. Maybe some of the listeners on, the, on this webinar, maybe you've experienced that already. I know where we farm, we are uh, kind of going through a shift uh, in, in our organic matter levels. We haven't necessarily improved it by 1%, but in some areas through the use of cover crops, we are increasing that organic matter. But again, 1%, is a big shift. It's worth a lot of money, but it's even worth more long term. And again, one more time, we one can't improve or we can't improve our organic matter until they begin adding carbon to the system. And carbon is live plants and plant material or live roots and plant material. The second concept that I think is really important is aggregate stability. So I put this graphic to get <coughs> together as a way to attempt to show our sales team and our dealer network how plant roots build aggregates. First, if you go from one to five there, first you need the live roots to interact with organism, organisms in the soil. This formation of hyphae really helps build soil webs or bunches or bundles which capture other organic matter and other soil particles. These bundles, if you will, use carbon to help glue more aggregates together. It's an ever turning cycle that ultimately leads to more and more microbes and really greater soil stability, all because carbon allowed all the components of the microbiota or that, that ecosystem to feed. Without that carbon, none of this happens. And stability, if we think about aggregate stability, maybe I'll go back to this slide one more time. Perhaps you've seen, um, you've seen di different demonstrations and, and maybe I should have had a picture on here about a slake test um, where you have uh, two different types of soil. I know Ray Archuleta and different, different folks across the industry. Uh, Barry Fisher over in Indiana has done a lot of work, done a lot of demonstrations where he's had two um, jars of water. One has a, a, a clod, I'll call it a soil taken from a traditional tillage uh, ecosystem, one from a no-till with cover crop system, and you can see how uh, whenever they're placed in water and suspended in water, how one completely falls apart. There's no stability there, whereas the one in no-till and cover crops um, holds together much more. It's all about that aggregate stability. And if you want to see that, I don't have a link here on this presentation, but you can go to the go to YouTube and uh and and type in slake s-l-a-k-e test and you'll see a good many many good uh good demonstrations one actually from us as well so another part <clears throat> where i contribute aggregate stability to help again in my mind these aggregates are formed um, they form like an, a net as we mentioned before and they capture organic matter and they build soil structure Soil structure, it's hard to generate any kind of nutrient cycling that we correlate with cover crops without soil structure. Again, not only are we talking about structure helping the movement of air and water, but also nutrients. And I think this graphic illustrates how leftover nutrients remain after harvest and without a cover crop or some sort of green manure to, to catch those residual nutrients, there's no chance to release them back for the following crop. It's all about stability in soil structure. When it comes to nutrient cycling, kind of the third concept of improving soils with cover crops, I think a good chunk of this information 
is really fairly simple and easy to understand. Um, granted, uh, more data is being generated all the time. Um, and here we're looking at some right here. Uh, you might be familiar with the work of Dr. Tom Casper out of Ohio, or I'm sorry, Iowa State University. Now, uh, Dr. Matt Helmers is kind of taking over for some of the work that, uh, long work that Casper's done there. Those two have compiled plenty of data over the last decade or two on cover crops role in reducing nitrate loads and tile drainage. Um, again, I'm sure a lot of listeners have seen some of this data before. I thought this slide illustrated their findings fairly well in both corn and soybeans over a, a five to six year period, cereal rye reduced nitrate uh, loads by 36% in corn and 34% in soybeans. Uh, Dr. Casper has um, data and research in place that goes back to, I think, the early 2000s, maybe 2003, 2004, all the way up until a couple of years ago, that actually shows reduction in corn, um, uh, nitrate loads in corn of even substantially greater than 36%. So when we talk about nutrient cycling, using a small grain cover crop, um, again, pretty easy to understand how those cover crop uh, acres or those cover crop species can capture that leftover nitrate and keep it from going downstream. We know the rye captured that nitrogen, but we'll see in a little bit on another set of data that I'm going to present if we can figure out when it's actually released. And I think that's the that's part of the the equation here that the industry, the cover crop industry, is trying to pinpoint a little bit better is when, let's say, if you've captured nitrogen from from cereal rye or you've captured nitrogen or potassium from another cover crop, when are we going to get that that nutrient um, value back? To our cash crop. Again, I have a little bit of work to show you out of Oregon State, but there's a lot of work yet to do for sure. This slide here reveals some research that we partnered with in Pennsylvania a couple years ago. Notice here on the bottom that these covers were planted following wheat harvest. So as we learned earlier, um, when we're talking about the calendar and, uh, and how much time we have, these crops had plenty of time to capture sunlight and growing degree days to maximize growth and root mass. And by the way, growing degree days, this is kind of a, a, a moving target a little bit, but in my mind for like, we talk about getting radish or turnips planted on time to maximize growth. Let's, let's concentrate on radish. I think most radish really need somewhere between 700 and 800 growing degree days, typically across the state. Uh, maybe we're getting planted, we're getting radish planted on time to get those, but in a lot of occasions, we're not even getting anywhere close to that. We're probably getting somewhere around three to 400 growing degree days. I'm not saying that that doesn't create a beneficial plan because it, it surely does. But if we had, you know, if we had it out there a few weeks earlier, we could capture a whole lot more. So again, this slide speaks to cover crops being able to grow and capture sunlight um, for most of the summer and into fall. There were six cover crop species that were compared and they were tested prior to winter. So they were planted in Holtwood, Pennsylvania sometime in mid-July and these tests were taken somewhere in late, um, I, I should have had the date on here, late November, early December. The nutrients that are mobile, if, if we talk about mobile nutrients in the soil like nitrogen, potassium and sulfur, they were captured in fairly high uh, fairly large amounts. It's not just about nitrogen, it's about potassium and sulfur as well. And even phosphorus levels, which, pho which typically phosphorus is fairly immobile in the soil, um, they were fairly, you know, surprisingly high as well. It just goes to prove that these covers can quickly catch plenty of value um, if we can get these planted after harvest. There's more nutrients out there in our fields and maybe what we first thought. So I, it's imperative to talk about the nitrogen cycle when we're talking about nutrient cycling. And all the nitrogen cycle basically is, is it shows the process by which nitrogen is converted between all of its various forms. And these conversions can be both biological and physical. 
So understand that the majority of our atmosphere is nitrogen. And, you know, that's, uh, that's about 78%. And I think everybody understands that. So when you exhale, when you finally get done listening to me, Gavin, this morning on this webinar, you'll be breathing in 78% nitrogen. So what you see on the screen is a grossly oversimplified diagram of the nitrogen cycle. It, came, it comes from University of Missouri. I think it represents what goes on fairly well. Um, it shows that, uh, you know, plant usable ammonium is part of the equation as well. I, I remember when I, when I have this kind of diagram on the screen, I like to think about things in a very simple and simplistic manner. I know the image is a little bit blurry, so I apologize for that. But, but the basic in cycle shows to me that in nitrogen changes from organic matter in the soil to bacteria, then over to plants, and then back to organic matter again. That's basically what we're talking about. If we take it a step further and convert that simple nitrogen cycle into one that's maybe a little bit more complex, nitrogen enters the cycle in other ways too. Think about inorganic nitrogen from the atmosphere, from, from in industry. Um, that's all going on. Legumes convert this atmos atmospheric nitrogen into plant soluble or plant, I'm sorry, plant usable or plant available nitrogen. And I'll speak to plant available nitrogen in one second, but be before I transition to that, I need to address how nitrogen is lost. If we look on the bottom, when we look over on the right side, besides denitrification and volatilization, N is lost by runoff and leaching. So le we're talking about leaching here. Um, that's just another reason that it's critical to have an active soil ecosystem made up of living roots to maximize or I should say minimize those potential losses. We can, we can minimize the losses of leaching, but we gotta have a healthy uh, soil ecosystem made with, with plants and, and crop residues. The next couple slides, I wanna really quickly hit on the end contributions from various cover crops. Um, I have listed the typical in concentration. So we got rye grass and cereal rye on top, which are really pretty poor. And you can see some of the legumes that are a little bit higher. Um, the way these, these concentrations are measured is they're taken in the spring. Um, these were taken in, in an area where they overwintered and then they're sent away to a lab to have their percent nitrogen per ton of dry matter measured. There's, you can see there's a fairly large variance in the numbers with the legumes obviously corresponding to a larger number. So what does this mean? So taken from Oregon State, they've concluded that through these numbers and through a lot of different research in, in biomass um, collections in the, in the spring, that legumes can provide up to 100 pounds of plant available nitrogen. But in order to maximize that, they need to be killed at or around bud stage to maximize that benefit. Cereal crops like rye, wheat, triticale, barley that overwinter, they will immobilize quite a bit of plant available nitrogen. And total nitrogen as a percent of dry matter is as good a predictor that I feel like we have as anything. I use it a lot when I'm out talking to growers. Um, we do a lot of biomass uh, measurements as a way to understand exactly how much plant available nitrogen we have. It just, again, it speaks to the value of these cover crops. And it's not just legumes. It's measuring the in in the biomass. So if we look at 3.5% nitrogen in dry matter, if you do the math and do the calculation, that's 35 pounds of plant available nitrogen per ton of dry matter. 1% in, well, that would be somewhere around 10 pounds or 10, uh, uh, 10 pounds, yeah, of plant available nitrogen per dry ton. So a lot of this plant available nitrogen can be released as soon as four to eight weeks after cover crop kill, but that kind of depends on the CN ratio. So if we look here again, the 1% percent in a dry matter, we're talking about again, a lot of our grasses, even after 10 weeks time, we, we haven't got any of that plant available nitrogen to be released into the soil, which makes sense because a lot of our rye residues can hold on to nitrogen for a long time. That's where I spoke about earlier. We need a little bit more uh, research in our industry to really hone in on what that looks like but we know it takes a little bit longer than four to eight weeks for sure. 
where if you go down to the bottom, three and a half percent nitrogen per ton of dry matter, um, which which equates to you know potentially a, a lot more than that, we can get in four to ten weeks' time, we can get a fairly large kickback of nitrogen available and released to our uh, our following cash crop. So I've talked a lot about carbon and I've talked a lot about nitrogen. So again, I think I'm preaching to the choir here when I talk about the CN ratio, but why is that important? Well, most of you know, cover crops have different CN ratios depending on the stage of growth they're in when they're terminated. Cereal rye, for example, left to flower could have a CN ratio around 40 to one. If, it, if you're looking at the straw, it could be more like 80 to one, 80 units of carbon to one unit of nitrogen. Whereas rye that's terminated in its early vegetative period, maybe it's more likely to have a CN ratio of 20 to one or maybe 25 to one. The larger the CN ratio, the slower the, the decomposition rate, meaning that nitrogen and other nutrients could be tied up if not managed properly. That's why terminating grass cover crops in front of corn is recommended to do it early in the vegetative state. Um, because otherwise you will have nitrogen that is immobilized. And I use, for, for Illinois, I use 24 to 1. That ratio seems to be a, a pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good balanced microbial diet for the soil. So anything larger than 24 to 1, we tend to have a, a deficit in the soil. Anything less than 24 to 1, and we'll get that, we'll get that uh, mineralized, that nitrogen mineralized fairly quick. Quickly. And again, it speaks to if we go back up to estimating plant available nitrogen release, we can see that those those three and three and a half percent nitrogen numbers, those come from species that have a relatively low carbon nitrogen ratio. So lastly, I'm going to talk about water holding and, infiltra and uh, water infiltration. They kind of go hand in hand. One can't see the true benefit of increased water infiltration and water holding without changing one's carbon and consequently their organic matter. Again, it goes back to carbon. If you remember on the earlier slide from Ohio State, just a 1% increase in organic matter raised the water holding capacity by as much as 27,000 gallons of water per acre. Yes, that does take some time, but in the short term, other advantages can happen as well. For instance, deep rooting cover crops can lead to deeper rooting cash crops. Uh, instead of cash crops, maybe the roots extending eight to 12 inches, think about how the possibility of maybe extending those three or four times that. It's safe to say that any kind of residue mat that's left on the soil, we talked about maybe some rye mats and soybeans, how that can lessen soil evaporation as well. And if we're talking about hyphae, this graphic from uh, Sayer, illustrates the extension of mycorrhizal hyphae on corn roots. Like we talked about earlier, the hyphae produced on live roots only happens, and you can see there on the bottom right, it only happens thanks to a healthy soil ecosystem. And it's not too hard to theorize how all of that hyphae net would have a much larger or much more increased ability to retain moisture. So I want to shift to real quick, I'm almost done here, how we can integrate cover crops into the rotation. Um, when, when I talk to growers, when I talk to retailers, I ask them three things. One, what is my goal and what am I trying to accomplish? Two, we talked about it earlier, can I plant a cover crop to achieve what I'm trying to get accomplished given my current cropping system? So you got to figure out what your current cropping window is given your, your goal and what you need to plant to reach that goal. And third, and maybe the biggest consideration is, if I figured out that I need to plant uh, a certain cover crop to reach my goal, am I willing to make a change or commit to a change in my crop rotation to make that crop succeed? If you can't answer yes to this, then I'm, unfortunately, we're not gonna see the true benefit of the cover crop. And I think one tool that's out there that I think is as good as any is, you've probably all heard of the Midwest Cover Crop Council. They'd have a selector tool on their website. Um, here's just a, a, a shot of that. You can go to Midwest Cover Crop Council. Um, 
dot msu dot edu or just google midwest cover crop council and it'll take you to their website and you can find their selector tool so on here i punched in you can punch in your state you can punch in your county on you can put your cash crop in you can even put your drainage class from from very poorly drained all the way to to well drained there's a lot of different options to pick from and then you can select your goals what are you trying to accomplish are you trying to break up compaction are you trying to sequester nutrients are you trying to feed some livestock and then what it'll it'll spit out for you is is a kind of a chart on what at what options you can plant and if they'll work and if they'll fit into your window again i think it's a really good tool if you're not familiar with it i would encourage you to go to the website and play with it a little bit so how can we get these planted obviously a lot of guys are using some sort of a cedar or a planter the seed after harvest that works really good but again, we might be limited on time. More guys are starting to use cedars on, a, on some sort of a, a Safford or some sort of tillage tool. Again, works good, but we're talking about after harvest here. Some guys are putting the cedar like a Gandy seed box on their, on their combine, so that speeds up the process even a little bit more. Great if you have time to do it. We're hearing more and more momentum about guys planting at you know V3 to V5, maybe V7 into corn. Uh, interseeding that's happening more in the northern uh, Midwest where again we have less time than what we do even across uh, most of Illinois. Um, starting to see quite a bit of good research come out of uh, Canada and parts of Michigan on some of this uh, some of what they're doing on interseeding. I know we've tried interseeding on our farm with mixed results. Uh, it takes moisture, it takes the right kind of equipment for sure. Here's a picture of a Hagee again with drops. Um, this technology has, has come a long way in the last five years. More and more uh, growers have this kind of equipment. Uh, there's some retailers across the state of Illinois that have this kind of equipment. Works good, but uh, we're not getting seed in the ground. We're just laying seed on top of the ground, just like we do whenever we're flying cover crops into corn or soybeans. We're relying on either irrigation or mother nature to help us maximize seed to soil contact. So it doesn't really matter what method you you uh, you want to want to go with, or what method will fit into your cropping cycle? You've got to get the cover crop seed out there. And again, we probably rely more on aerial and some of these uh, other kind of uh, you know piggy equipment, these uh, applicators that go in crop. Where we rely more on the, those when uh, when we're in our basic corn and soybean rotation. Um, if you can integrate another crop in there, it might give you more time to plant a cover crop. I would encourage you to do so if that if that fits your goals. Obviously, what we want to be left with is a cover crop standing in a cornfield. This happens to be a, a, a field of ours a couple of years ago that got a lot of moisture after being aerial applied. Not every field, as you guys know, looks as good as this, but this is a good day for sure. So additional cover crop services is what I like to call it that we didn't talk about today, but for, for sure go on and have an impact on soil health would be weed suppression and, and pest control. Uh, again, using cover crops as a source of forage or even using covers as a, as a habitat uh, area for wildlife. And we're talking more and more about pollinators and their need in our ecosystem. Uh, we're, we're talking more about uh, butterflies as well, the monarch and, and uh, the lack of milkweed that we have across the countryside these days. So cover crops serve a lot of purposes for sure. I just want to leave you with one little tidbit here. Um, my role within our company, I, I get asked to speak to a lot of different groups and, and uh, I do a lot of work online. I do some blog information. Just want to leave you with, there's some other things that are really on, uh, hot topics right now in the industry. Um, herbicide interactions and burn down requirements for sure. Um, I've done a lot of work on this. In fact, I led a webinar with No-Till Magazine last summer, and it was just about herbicide interactions with cover crops. So I would encourage you to go to that website. You can also find it from our website. Talk a lot about vol and slug control. Um, there's There's been a, a lot of different uh, corn and soybean companies that have uh, have been asking about what can we do. And I know with soybean farmers, uh, the voles have played havoc uh, across uh, across many parts of the country, or across most parts of Illinois the last couple of years. So if you want more information on that, maybe we can talk off offline or you can go to our website and you can find some of the work that I've done there. 
also legume inoculation. If you're not, if you're using a cover crop legume and you're not inoculating it with the proper strain, um, you're missing the mark and you're losing some of the true value of that, of that legume. So I would encourage you to make sure you're using the right strain of inoculant or the right strain of rhizobia when you're inoculating your legumes. And then seed quality. Uh, my, again, I, you know my role within ASTA, talk a lot about seed quality. Just, you know, if, if you're buying seed uh, from, a, from a farmer or you're growing seed yourself and you're going to market that seed, make sure you're following uh, state seed laws and make sure you're doing the right thing to, to, keep, uh, to keep weeds at bay. Um, again, you've, you've heard the last couple of years, some of the issues the industry has had with uh, Palmer amaranth and the spread of that. Some of that can be linked to some pollinator seedings and uh, some of that habitat. All of that happens because people in the industry aren't, aren't following the, the rules or at least not, uh, not looking into it and giving it as much attention as they possibly should. So make sure you're abiding by those and making sure, make sure that you keep our cover crops a cover crop. We don't want cover crops to turn into a weed problem down the road. And my last issue is trucking. I want everybody on this, this uh, call here to understand that trucking in our industry is or we're not a we're not separate from other industries across the across the country. Um, thanks to the hurricanes that we've seen last year in the south and in you know Florida, Houston, um, that took a lot of uh, trucks away from the Midwest. And we're talking about cover crops here. A lot of the cover crops are grown in areas up north in Canada, the upper Midwest, all the way out to Oregon, Idaho, Washington. These cover crops need to be shipped into this part of the country. And thanks to the, uh, the uh, electronic log um, initiatives that are out there and laws, and then uh, just an overall lack of drivers in the trucking industry, the, the amount of trucks that we have in our industry are available to us, and maybe you've seen this already in some of what you guys do, um, it is going to play a role. So the message here is if you're interested in cover crops or whoever you're working with, whether you're working with uh, you yourself or uh, an, an, a seed supplier or a retailer, make sure you're having these conversations earlier than later because in season, it's gonna be tough to get that seed delivered. Just uh, one more little plug, we have an app. You can, uh, you can go, you can find that app on, uh, on the App Store or Google Play, it's Lacrosse Seed. You can search for it, you can find a lot of different information at your fingertips. And I also write a monthly e-newsletter called The Dirt. And you can find that at our website as well. I'm trying on the dirt to, to keep up to speed on all of these different uh, topics that I just mentioned. And there's a lot of good information there that I think you can find. So I want to appreciate your time um, today. I know I didn't give a lot of time for questions. If you want to reach out to me, my email address is up there in the upper left hand corner. If you want to look on our website to find, uh, to find some additional resources, again, I would encourage you to go to the Midwest Cover Crop Council if you haven't done that already and check out their, their selector tool. It's a really good tool. So with that, I'll say again, thank you and uh, maybe have a couple minutes here for questions. Yep, thank you, Scott. And we do have time for just a couple questions. Um, first one, how do you control water in early September? Yeah, can you say that again? I didn't hear you very well. Oh, sorry. How do we control water hemp with layered residuals and still plant cover crops in late August and early September? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, there's, there's no doubt that, uh, that our water hemp, um, our amaranth species are creating uh, havoc across the state of Indiana or Illinois and across the whole country. Um, I think, you know, research out of, uh, from uh, Dr. Bradley at University of Missouri has showed that we can, uh, we can do both of these. We can use cover crops. We can effectively uh, find the right combination of, of herbicides to do that. And the, the cover crops aren't going to necessarily control all of our summer annuals, but they will control. They do a pretty good job of controlling winter annuals. For sure. If, if we can, if we can combine, um, if we're talking about soybeans, if we can combine small grains along with the right chemistry, and I know I'm probably not answering the question, I would say that if, if you need help pinpointing what herbicides, what residual herbicides to use in that, 
in that uh, in that scenario, I would be happy to talk uh, or share some some emails uh, offline after this call is over. But we can do it. People are doing it in in certain parts of the country. It's not easy, and it does uh, it does require a couple of shifts, but it can be done. Again, the webinar I did last year. I spoke to all the different uh, herbicide chemistries that are out there and what we're seeing as an organization with all the retailers that we talk to and work with. What are they hearing out there? What's working? What's causing issues? What's not allowing cover crops to, to germinate? Again, the, the, the label, the herbicide label is the law for sure. Um, but if you're not going to take that cover crop, if you're not going to uh, harvest it and use it for forage, then you can basically, I mean, it's up to you to do whatever, you, if you wanna break that law and do some things, and frankly, we have to probably bend the rules a little bit, and we're doing that every year to get cover crops to grow anyway, that's your prerogative. If we're talking about feeding livestock and using those crop residues to feed livestock that go into our you know, food system, then, then that's a whole different conversation and you are, you are breaking the law. But, uh, we can fit these residuals into our crop rotation and uh, and still allow us to use cover crops. It's just a, it's a conversation that potentially we need to have offline. Thank you. Thanks. Next, next question. When you talk to growers, is there any interest using flowering cover crops to attract beneficial insects? Yeah, in fact, we're seeing, um, if you looked at, it's a great question, if, if, if you look at our sales figures and, and sales figures across the industry um, that I'm kind of uh, um, subject to looking at, or uh, I have uh, the advantage of being exposed to, um, a lot of our flowering legumes and flowering broadleaves are, uh, are really on the rise. And you could attribute that to potentially some of the pollinator programs um, that, that have been uh, you know, instilled across the country. Um, I think um, more guys are getting used to letting and understand the value of letting our legumes and different uh, different broadleaf cover crops, letting them grow a little bit longer. Maybe that's because of experience, but um, our flowering, uh, I'm just thinking about crimson clover as one. Crimson clover sales across the industry have really, uh, really ballooned here the last couple of years. And I think a lot of that is not just People aren't recognizing the value of crimson clover necessarily as a nitrogen source as much as they recognize the fact that it does have other uses and other, and, and other values as well. Great. Well, thank you very much, Scott. That concludes our webinar on cover crops and soil health. You will find this webinar and other soybean and agronomic resources on the Freckoff-funded website, ilsoyadvisor.com. Thank you for attending and have a great day.